احمده و نسلی علی رسوله الکریم اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي واجعل لي بذيغ من اخلي اللهم فقهنا في الدين رب زدني علما اللهم اني اسالك علما نافعا رزقا طيبا وعملا متقبلا اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه اللهم ارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين ثم امين سوره النور the sura was revealed in madina it has nine stanzas 64 verses it is the 24th by the order of arrangement and 102nd by the order of revelation the sura gets its name from the verse number uh, from the fifth uh, from the first verse of the fifth stanza where allah mentions allah nuru samawati wal ard and <clears throat> regarding the period of revelation there is consensus of opinion that it was sent down after the campaign against bani mustalik and this is confirmed by the verses 11 to 20 which deal with the incidents of uh, slander which occurred during this campaign but there is a difference of opinion as to whether this campaign took place in 5 ah before the battle of trench or in 6th year after the migration it is important to decide this issue in order to determine whether this sura was sent down earlier or sura azab <coughs> to decide whether this surah was sent down earlier or surah ahzab because uh, this is the only other surah of quran which contains commandments about the observance of farda by the muslim women now surah ahzab was admittedly it was sent down after um, on the occasion of the battle of trench Now, if this battle occurred earlier, it would mean that the initial instructions in connection with the commandments of Farda they were sent down in Surah Azam, and then they were complemented later by the commandments revealed in Surah Nur. On the other hand, if uh, we believe that the campaign against Bani Mustalik it occurred earlier, then the chronological order of the commandments would be reversed. and um, it would be it would become difficult to understand the legal wisdom and the implications of the commandment of farda by certain uh, companions like ibn sa'd it has been reported that the campaign campaign against bani mustalik it took place in shaban 5 ah and the battle of trench in zikada in the same year this opinion is based on some traditions from uh, hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha where she explains the incident of <coughs> slander on other hand uh, muhammad bin ishaq uh, he reports that the battle of the trench it took place in shawal 5 ah and the campaign against bani mustalik it took place in shaban 6 ah so this opinion is also supported by some authentic traditions from hazrat aisha and others and so according to this <clears throat> we would relate it like this that the commandments of farda had been sent down in surah azab before the incidents of slander and uh, then holy prophet married as a zainab radiyallahu ta'ala anha in 5 age after the battle of trench and so hazrat hamna the sister of hazrat zainab radiyallahu ta'ala anha she took part a leading part in spreading this planned uh, slander against hazrat aisha just because she happened to be one of her rivals of her sister so these uh, ev- evidences these support the view of uh, muhammad bin ishaq however by other traditions and by the point of view of many other scholars and commentators we can conclude that surah ahzab was sent down earlier and surah nur was sent down after surah ahzab as far as the historical background and the basic summary related to this historical background of uh, the summary of the surah is that um, when the disbelievers they they realized that they could not defeat islam in the battlefield then they chose the moral front to carry on the conflict and they started their wicked designs 
to lead them to uh, to start defaming Islam and to now Zubillah start defaming Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So therefore the strategy was attained to with the assistance of the hypocrites of Medina to spread slander against Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his followers. So the first opportunity uh, they took hold of was when in Zilhaj, uh, Zilqada 5AH, when Prophet ﷺ married Hazrat Zainab uh, bin Tajahash, who was the divorced wife of his adopted son, Hazrat Zaid bin Hadisa. So they raised a lot of opposition, negating the behavior of Prophet ﷺ, saying things like, Nauzubillah, Summa Nauzubillah, Minzalik, that Prophet ﷺ had Nauzubillah fell in love with her and he maneuvered his divorce and then married her. So there were allegations and accusations against Prophet Sallallahu Then the second slander was made against the honor of Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha in connection with an incident which occurred while he, she was returning from, while Prophet Sallallahu was returning from the campaign against Bani uh, Mustariq. So to uh, these were like a few allegations which were put against Prophet Sallallahu So now to counteract and to neutralize all these, <clears throat> all these corruptive behaviors and all the malice, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, revealed, revealed the verses of Surah Noor, giving a basic guideline to the Muslims regarding the rules and regulations of an Islamic state, um, uh, regarding the moral values of Islam and the Islamic state. So keeping this in background, we shall now be going through the verses of Surah Noor. <coughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Suratun anzalnaha wa farazna wa anzalna fiha ayatim bayyina tilla'allakum tazakkaroon. This is a surah which we have sent down and made that within it obligatory and revealed therein verses of clear evidence that you might remember. A very effective introduction to the surah start with the starting verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the chapter, the surah which you are going to go through is what? Anzalnaha. It has been sent down by me. Allah has specifically highlighted that these verses of surah Nur are revealed and sent down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the Quran is a divine guidance. All the Quran is a divine guidance and the revelation of Allah. But specifically before, before these verses, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention to highlight the importance of the verses? And especially also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also said what? Wa so especially before the commandments in which people might be confused, might be doubtful. So to highlight the importance of these, of these verses and all the commandments, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has highlighted even more by saying that I have made it obligatory. So we do know that all the orders of Quran, all the do's and don'ts of Quran, they are obligatory for all the Muslims to be obeyed. But here's specifically mentioned to make clear that the commandments of all the commandments of Surah Nur are what? They are obligatory. They have to be obeyed. And then Allah has also mentioned ayatim bayinat, that they are the clear cut verses so that no doubt, no confusion in understanding and comprehending the orders and the commandments of the verses of Surah Nur. <coughs> Verse number two, the unmarried woman or the unmarried man found guilty of fornication or adultery or zina, lash each one of them with a hundred lashes and do not be taken by pity for them in the religion of Allah if you should believe in Allah and the last day and let a group of believers witness their punishment. This is the divine law for the punishment of adultery. And the order of punishment for a man or a woman committing adultery or fornication in an Islamic state. This is a law of Quran and it is known as the had of zina. What do we mean by had is that 
Had is any punishment for a crime which Quran has suggested Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has enjoined himself in the verses of Quran. So this is a Quranic law. This is a divine law, a law for fornication that is lashing with hundred lashes or stoning to death. Then uh, we do come across other laws, divine laws, also in Quran, other than this law of fornication or the had of zina. Then there is the had of qazaf. This is the had or the punishment for the false accusation of fornication. And then we have talked about the had of sarqa. That is the, the punishment, the divine punishment or the divine law for stealing or creating a theft. That was what has been explained in Quran as the amputation, amputation of the hand. And then for murder. For intentional murder is the had of kisas, that is blood for blood. So here in these verses is the law for the punishment of an unmarried male and a female, a woman and a male committing what? Committing adultery. Allah says, Fajlidu. Lashing or flogging has been suggested as a punishment. And why has the word Fajlidu been used? Because it is from jild. Jild means the skin. It has been co called as Fajlidu because uh, we do know that the lash, which is used for lashing and flogging, is made out of the skin of the animals. And uh, moreover, the affliction of lashing is also taken by the skin of the lashed person. Hundred lashes, there should be no mercy, and there has to be, there have to be witnesses at the time of lashing. Because what we need to understand is that the laws of Quran. They, when they award punishment, they are, number one, they're very severe and they're very intense. Then they are sudden, that they are being conducted. They, it's ordered to conduct them without any delay and without any postponement. And the third thing is that they are conducted publicly. The purpose of the, of the laws of Quran being very severe, intense, and being conducted publicly is so that to let those observing learn a lesson. <clears throat> and in this way, it will be possible to uproot the crime from the society. Because of the intense penalty, this will act as a deterrent. And the punishment is conducted publicly. People observing this will definitely serve as a deterrent to take out the crime from the society. So the punishment for an adulterer is 100 lashes if an unmarried uh, woman and a man, they indulge in adultery and it is regime. It is regime or stoning to death if a married person indulges in fornication. The verses for uh, the verses for the stoning to death, that is regime, they were revealed in Quran, as has been reported by Hazrat Umar anhu, that he reports that the verses were revealed and we heard Prophet recite them to us. But later on, they were taken away from the memory of Prophet and the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the order and the commandment or the law for stoning to death for the married fornicator, they are no longer in the the Quran, but despite the fact that they were taken away from the memory of Prophet, ﷺ, despite the fact, even after that, the punishment which was um, which was given by which was uh, uh, extended by the Prophet ﷺ in his life were always stoning to death for if a married man and a woman they indulged in fornication. <clears throat> the punishment is no doubt very severe. The reason why the punishment is so severe is that this immorality, if this crime or this immorality, if it gets launched in a society, then the results are disastrous. The results are disastrous and they are far-fetched also. The society where adultery, it becomes prevalent, it is an immoral society and is no longer a human society, it becomes a jungle of wild beasts. And this immorality, it will, if it gets launched in a society, it will totally disrupt and it will ruin the basic unit of the society that is the house, that is the home of the Muslims. Because this house is what? It is the nursery 
to the tiny Muslim plants, the children of the house. So the basic unit of the house, it becomes disrupted and the grievous results, they carry on for generations to come. So this law of punishment is extremely severe. And uh, this law of regime was also obligatory in the followers of the previous, pro previous prophets also. <clears throat> In the Old Testament and the New Testament, clearly awarding punishment of death for the, for the married fornicator has been clearly mentioned. Moreover, this severe punishment has been advised in a Muslim society where steps to control immorality have been already introduced in the verses of Surah Nur. It is not just a random punishment. No. Prior to giving a punishment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also given orders and commandments regarding steps to control all forms of immorality in the Islamic state, like for Muslim women. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that they need to stay in their houses and they just do not need to roam about in the society without any, without any uh, actual need or cause. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the Muslim women that when they leave their houses, they are going to be all clad. <coughs> they are going to be clad with their covering dresses, like Allah says, And Allah orders, So they've been ordered to conceal all forms of adornments when they come out of house. Then there's order for the lowering of the gaze, both for the men and the women. And then there is a stopping of the free intermixing of men and women. And then there is promoting and encouraging of nikah. And then uh, this, is the, this is obviously to promote nikah and to assist nikah is obviously with the purpose of providing conditions and a, a halal spouse for the natural physical desires. And then there's permission of uh, marrying more than one woman, like more than one wives. And then there's permission of divorce. And then there's prohibition of prostitution. Prostitution have, has been declared as unlawful. And uh, in the verses, there is stopping of all forms of vulgarity. And then last but not the least, finally, in this background of all commandments of deterring all forms of immorality, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala imposes a heavy legal action of an Islamic Quran by punishing, by punishing all those indulging in adultery and fornication. Moreover, the conditions, the conditions in which this punishment will be given, they have been very clearly specified. They have been very clearly specified the conditions under which the punishment will be awarded. Like it has been clearly highlighted that a person has to be a Muslim, an adult, and has to be sensible. That is, um, the person should not be insane or under the effect of any intoxicant. That is, should be not out of senses. Any uh, uh, any man or any woman when commits zina or adultery intentionally out of free will and is adult and is sane and sensible. Then when these, when these, the punishment will be conducted, when they will be, will be only awarded if there are four adult Muslim men witnessing the couple actually in the act of complete sexual intercourse, not just touching each other or kissing or lying close to one another, will this punishment be awarded? So, so we can clearly see from here that if a couple loses modesty and morality to the extent that committing the whole act in the presence of four adult Muslim men does not seem to bother them, then it is this couple who has to be lashed or who has to be stoned because, because this is mandatory to save the society from the immoral activities of such immoral, immoral criminals. So in conditions of um, forced fornication, that is rape, it is only the man who will be punished, but the oppressed women will obviously won't be punished. Moreover, instead of four witnesses, if a person confesses, if the person confesses committing zina and comes out 
with his confession four times, even then the punishment will be awarded. Two such cases, they were reported in the, in the life of Prophet Sallallahu when there was a slave, Maaz bin Malik of Banu Aslim, he committed adultery and he mentioned it to his master, Hosal bin Noim. And the master suggested that he should um, confess this in front of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and ask him to pray for his forgiveness. And the slave, um, Hazrat Maaz bin Malik, he did as he was advised by his master. And he went to see Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he confessed in front of him for the first time. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam turned away his face towards the other side. He went to the other side and made a second confession. But then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi just kept quiet and he ignored. He made a third confession. Even then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was still silent and he just ignored. And the companions, uh, they warned him that if he made his fourth convention, uh, confession, then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi will have to award him with the punishment of the divine law. He was, he was sincerely desirous of forgiveness. So he continued and then he made the fourth confession. confession. And uh, when he had confessed for the fourth time, then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he interrogated to a great depth before the punishment was awarded. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him to what extent he had gone into the physical relationship that was it actual penetration or was it just mere foreplay? And he told that it was a proper, complete physical relationship that he had conducted. Then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi asked him and the people surrounding him, was he insane or was he drunk? And uh, then the people, one of the companions got up and smelled his mouth also. And so after a meticulous interrogation, then the punishment of Rijam, that is stoning to death, was awarded by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and after the death of Maaz bin Malik, the funeral prayer was also offered. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Maaz, he has sincerely seeked forgiveness. And this forgiveness is such that if it be divided to the whole of the Ummah, it would have been sufficient for all. And then we, uh, come, or we come across the incident of uh, a lady, Siptia, Siptia Ramdia from uh, Banu Ramdia. She committed adultery and then she came up to Prophet Sallallahu and she confessed her action. And uh, as a proof, she also mentioned that she had conceived and she requested for the punishment to be awarded because and to purify her of her sin. And Prophet Sallallahu asked her to go back and to come after uh, the childbirth. She came after the childbirth and Prophet Sallallahu asked her to go back again and to come back after the completion of her lactation. And she came after two years carrying her baby with a piece of bread in his hand. And then she asked to be punished and purified again. And then uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, obviously um, punishment would, um, these, these people, these people and these companions, they were the people who just realized that the punishment of this world is much lighter than the eternal punishment of the eternal life hereafter. And punishment was um, awarded against her also because she had begged for forgiveness with such a pure soul that Prophet Sallallahu said that her forgiveness would be sufficient for the people of Medina. Not only all this, we also learn that in addition to all the above rules of conducting the punishment, we have also been taught and laid down precisely the details have been laid down for the, for the method of flogging or lashing. Like it has been instructed in the traditions that in summers, it has to be carried out in the cooler part of the day. And in winters, they, it has to be carried out in a uh, in a warmer part of the day, the men, they have to be kept standing and the women, they are, they are lashed when they are sitting and the convict is not tied up. The clothes are not taken off. The body is not naked, especially for men. Uh, we realize that only the shirt might be taken off, but for women, no clothes are taken off. And flogging is with a lash, which is not like a whip. 
and uh, it should not be also too thick so that the area of which is lashed it increases and the details of the lash according to the hadith has been told that it should not be too thin and sharp so that it might cut the skin it should not be too thick to increase the lashed area and it should not be knotted it should not have two edges or two tongue and the judge, the judge awarding the punishment of flogging should conduct the first few lashes himself to instruct and to demonstrate the exact and the right manner and the style of lashing and flogging. And the person conducting the flogging should not raise his arm too high as would show his axilla and the lashing is distributed over the different parts of the body not just uh, not just is the lash struck on just one part of the body to take away the skin and to pull out the skin no because the whole of the body has to be lashed because the crime was was collective the crime was a collective act of the whole of the body so the lashing has to be distributed over all the body now with these details of um, how uh, finely the details have been given, but the strict instruction that no one has the authority to increase or decrease the number of the lashes. Because it has been reported in a tradition that Prophet Salazim said that on the day of judgment, a judge who had reduced the punishment by just one stripe in a certain case will be called to account. And he will be asked, why did you do so? He will say, it was out of pity for your people. Allah will say, well, it means you were more compassionate towards those people than myself. Then it will be ordered to take him to hell. Another judge who had enhanced the punishment by just one stripe will be brought forth. And he will be also asked, why did you do that? The person will say, the judge will say, he will say, it was done as a deterrent for others. And Allah will say, well, it will mean that you thought that you were wiser than me with regards to them. And then it will be also ordered for him that he should be thrown in the hell fire also. This has been uh, mentioned in Tafsir ibn Qasir. So there it is, the importance of conducting the divine law as it is ordered in Quran. And this is the importance of this divine law for eradicating all forms of immorality and all forms of adulterous activities in the Islamic State. Verse number three, the fornicator does not marry except a female fornicator or a polytheist and none marries her except a fornicator or a polytheist and that has been made unlawful to the believers in the period of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who according to his uh, according to this uh, punishment uh, this verse he used to exile the fornicators and they he used to marry them with each other and those who accuse chaste women and then do not produce four witnesses, lash them with 80 lashes and do not accept from them testimony ever after. And those are the defiantly disobedient. Now, this verse explains another divine law, the Quranic law, Had of Qazaf. What is this? That when someone accuses a person of adultery or zina, but fails to provide four adult male Muslim witnesses, which is the basic prerequisite for the acquisition of uh, adultery, then the accuser, the accuser will be, according to the law of Qazab, awarded 80 lashes. Why is it so? The person... The person who is accusing hasn't committed zina himself. Then why is he being flogged? This is because the false accusation will lead to what? This will definitely lead to the propagation of immorality. This will lead to the propagation of dishonoring someone who is chaste and modest. So to stop or to put an end to the promotion, to the spreading, to the propagation of immoral stories and of illicit conversations in the society, this law has been imposed. Otherwise, you know, what will happen is that 
narrating all these events of immorality and narrating all these stories of adultery will have the effect that many eyes will see what one eye saw. Many ears will listen to what one ear heard. Many hearts will feel what one heart felt. So many innocent, many innocent people of the society, they will learn of these immoral activities, which they did not, which they were totally unaware of in their Muslim homes. Many unaware people, they may learn and many uninhibited people who were inhibited to take an immoral step might just feel encouraged or they might just feel confident or they might feel the they might get to know or they might get aware of the different ways and methods or manners to get to these things so the punishment is like for an adulterer it has prerequisites an adult muslim who accused out of free will and is mentally healthy and sane will be awarded this punishment of qazab and uh, this is to save the honor and of those honorable and those modest people in the society against all forms of false allegations and to save the society from immoral conversations also. Except for those who repent thereafter and reform, for indeed Allah is forgiving and merciful. And those who accuse their wives of adultery and have no witnesses except themselves, then the witness of one of them shall be four testimonies, four testimonies swearing by Allah that indeed he is of the truthful. And the fourth oath will be that the curse of Allah be upon him if he should be among the liars. Now, in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning another law, the law of la'an. This is an adverse situation in which sometimes a husband gets stuck up. The whole situation has been explained out in the verses uh, uh, from 6 to 10. And these, were, uh, these verses were revealed after an incident which took place in the life of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Now, these verses were sent down sometime after the preceding verses. The law of Qasaf had prescribed the punishment for a person who accused any other person, any other man or woman of zina, and did not come out with witnesses by providing four witnesses to prove his charge. But the question naturally arises is that when a man, what should a man do if he finds his wife involved in zina? If he kills her, he will be guilty of murder and will be punishment with the order or, or the law of Qisas. If he goes, if he goes to get witness, the offender might escape. And if he tries to ignore the matter, he cannot do so for long. He can, of course, divorce the woman. But in this case, there will be no moral or physical punishment either for the man or the woman who seduced her. And if um, the illicit intercourse, it results in pregnancy, he will have to suffer the burden of the bringing up of another person's child. So initially, this question was raised by Hazrat Saad bin Obada as a hypothetical case. It was just as a hypothetical case, he rose this question, who said that this, if happened, such and such condition happened, what would be the solution? But soon afterwards, actual cases also, they were brought to Prophet Sallallahu by husbands who were eyewitnesses of the things. And uh, there was a companion who came up with a situation initially, and uh, he had the same problem. He said that, uh, oh, messenger of Allah, if a person finds another man with his wife and he utters an accusation, you will enforce the prescribed punishment of qazaf. And if he commits murder, you will have him killed. And if he, if he, keep quiet, he just keeps quiet, he will remain involved in anguish. Then what should he do? At this, uh, it's been reported that Prophet said, Oh Allah, 
give me a solution of this of this problem and it has been reported in Muslim Bukhari Abu Dawood Muslim Ahmad and Nasai all and uh, Hazrat Ibn Abbas was Allah Ta'ala and who he reports in another incident of Hazrat Hilal bin Umayyah was Allah Ta'ala and who he also came up and he presented the case of his wife whom he had himself witnessed involved in the act of the sin and uh, it's been reported that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that bring your proof otherwise uh, you will have the prescribed punishment of qazaf inflicted on you now at this what happened was that there was panic among the companions and hazrat khalal bin umayyah radiyallahu ta'ala and he said that i swear by allah i swear by allah who has sent you as a prophet that i am speaking the truth i have seen it with my eyes and heard it with my ears and i am sure how reliant they were on allah he said that i am sure allah will send down a command which will protect my back from the punishment of qazaf and so these verses were revealed this has been reported in bukhari muslim ahmad and abu daud so when hazrat halal bin umayyah swore by allah about his truth and he was sure that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reveal some verses to prove his truth and to save him from the false punishment then the verses were revealed this is the excellence of the companions of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and when these verses were revealed then uh, prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he asked both the husband and the wife to come as atilal bin umayya and his wife they were presented before prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he recited these verses and he told them instructed them about the whole process and um, then he addressed them and he told he said that you should note it well that the punishment of hereafter is much severer than the punishment of this world and uh, halal bin umayya he submitted that his charge was absolutely correct and the woman denied it holy prophet then said then let's proceed according to the law of land and has at uh, halal bin umayya he stood up first and he swore oaths according to the quranic command and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam went on reminding him again and again that allah knows that one of you is certainly a liar then will one of you repent and before halal bin umayya swore for the fifth time people they also said to him fear allah the punishment of the world is lighter than that of your after and the fifth oath will make the punishment obligatory on you but halal said that allah who had protected his back from punishment in this world will also spare him in air after and this he swore for the fourth time also and then was a turn for the women she began swearing and before she swore the fifth oath she was also stopped and she was also suggested that fear allah the worldly punishment is easier to bear than the punishment of hereafter and that, that the last oath will make the divine punishment obligatory on you now hearing this she hesitated a little and the people thought that she was going to make confession but instead of that what she said was stubbornly that i do not want to put my clan to disgrace and i will not be a source of disgrace for my father and for my brother and she then swore for the fifth time also and uh, by this prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ordered separation between the two of them and uh, ruled that her child after the birth will be attributed to her and not to halal bin umayya and uh, prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also instructed that nobody after that blame on her would not blame her child and anybody who accused the child of being illegitimate will be what will there will be penalty of penalty of 80 lashes of qazaf on that child and um, after the completion of plan so what do we learn that they are no longer husband and wife and the nikah is terminated and if a child is born it will be associated with the mother and the person who calls or labels the child as an illegitimate baby then there will be penalty of 80 lashes of qazaf against the person who labels the child illegitimate but it will prevent punishment for her from her if she gives four testimonies swearing by allah that indeed he is of the liars and the fifth oath will be that the wrath of allah be upon her if he was of the truthful and if it not for the favor of allah upon you and his mercy and because allah is accepting of repentance and wise 
Indeed, those who came with falsehood are a group among you. Do not think it bad for you. Rather, it is good for you. For every person among them is what punishment he has earned from the sin. And he who took up upon himself the great portion thereof, for him is a great punishment. Now, verses 11 to 18 these are explaining the incident of slander, that is the false accusation of Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha by the hypocrites of Medina to defame Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his family. Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she herself makes the narration of the whole of the event of the incident of slander. Now, what the basic story and the main theme was that when in Shaban 6 AH, Prophet ﷺ, he learned that the people of Bani Mustalik, they were making preparations for war against the Muslims. And uh, they wanted, so Prophet ﷺ announced war against them and he forestalled and he took the enemy by surprise. So after capturing the people of the clan of Bani Mustalik and their belongings, Prophet ﷺ, he made a halt. He made a halt and uh, uh, there was a spring in the territory. Now, uh, regarding the water of the spring one day, there was a dispute uh, about taking the water from the spring. It started between the servant of Hazrat Umar and an ally of the clan of Hazrat. And uh, the, the quarrel developed between the Muhajir and the Ansar. And then for the time being, it got settled. This, however, was obviously against what Abdullah bin Ubayi wanted. So he joined in and um, he began to incite the Ansar. And he was saying, we will also come across the whole event while we are reading the verses of Surah uh, Munafikun. So it was uh, Abdullah bin Ubayi agitating the Ansar and inciting the Ansar. And he said that you yourself brought these people, that is the Muhajireen, of Quraysh from Mecca and made them partners with your wealth and property. And now that they have become your rivals and they want domination over you, even if now you withdraw your support from them, they shall be forced to leave the city. And then he swore and he declared that as soon as we reach back to Medina, the respectable people will now, Zubillah, now Zubillah, what he word he used, will take out the degraded people from the city. Now, so there was the fight between the Muhajir and the Ansar, it flared up. When Prophet ﷺ found out about this, he ordered the people to set off immediately and to march back to Medina. Now, this forced march, it continued up till the next noon and without a halt, and so that the people, when they when they stopped over, they were so exhausted that there was no uh, there was no time for all this fight and for this idle talk to continue. This was no doubt a wise judgment which was made by Prophet Sallallahu and this was a quick action by Prophet Sallallahu which surely averted the undesirable consequences of the mischief and the malice which was created by the hypocrites. But here again, Abdullah bin Abayi, he got another opportunity. He got another opportunity for doing a far more serious and a greater mischief. This was by engineering a slander against Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And uh, to understand the whole event, how the incidents of uh, slander was plotted and how it was built up. I would narrate exactly what Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha had narrated in her own words. Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said that whenever Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went out on a journey, he used to decide by lots as to which of his wives should accompany him. And uh, accordingly, it was decided this occasion when Prophet Sallallahu was leaving for the battle of Bani Mustalik, it was decided that I should accompany him during the expedition to Bani Mustalik. On the return journey, she explains that Prophet Sallallahu halted for the night at a place which was the last stage on the way back to Medina. And it was still the night when they began to make preparations for the march. So I went outside the camp to ease myself. And when I returned, I, I came near my halting place. I noticed that my necklace had fallen down somewhere. So I went back in search of it. But in the meantime, the caravan moved off. 
and I was left behind all by myself. Imagine all by herself, soul, a solitary soul in the desert. And she explains the region also. She explains that the four carriers of the litter, they had placed it on my camel without noticing that I was, it was empty and I was not in it. And this happened because of my light weight due to lack of food those days. And then when she was left all by herself, a solitary soul in the open desert, she said, what did she do? She wrapped herself in her sheet and she lay down in the hope that um, it will be found out the next morning that she had been left behind and a search party would come back to pick me up. But little we realize generally when we are going through all these incidents, how content she was, how how brave, how confident, how relaxed, how content. There's no tension, there's no anxiety, there is no fear or stress, and moreover, there's no cribbing or grumbling of any sort. And she says that in the meantime, I just fell asleep. So what happened the next morning is, she says that in the next morning, Hasid Safan bin Muattal, he passed that way, and he saw me, and he recognized me. And thanks to Hazrat Aisha Razillahu Ta'ala and her, that he, how did he happen to recognize her? He's, uh, Hazrat Aisha says that he had seen me several times before the commandment of Wail, before the commandment of Parda for Muslim women had been sent down. This proves what? This comment and statement of Hazrat Aisha Razillahu Ta'ala and her clearly proves and highlights that after after the revelation of the verses of Parda and after the revelation of the commandments of veil for Muslim women, no companion could or no companion did see the Umahatul Mu'mineen or the Muslim women with their faces open. So uh, in any case, uh, they had not, he could not see the Umahatul Mu'mineen after the order of the, the verses of veil. So Hazrat Aisha mentioned that he had seen me several times before the commandment of the Purda had been sent out. No sooner did he see me that he stopped his camel and he cried out. He said, how sad the wife of Prophet Sallallahu has been left here. And at this, she says that she woke up and all of a sudden, and what did she do? Again here, she has conveyed a very effective and a very important message. Hazrat Aisha said, that as she woke up, what did she do? She she covered my, she says that I covered my face with my sheet. Another proof, another very solid proof for the order, for the order of the veil being followed by the Umahatul Mu'mineen. She covered her face with her sheet when there was a non-Mehram Muslim companion of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now she says that without uttering another word, he made his camel kneel down by me and he stood aside while I clam climbed onto the camel's back. And then he led the camel by the nose string and we overtook the caravan at about noon when it had just halted and nobody had noticed that I had been left behind. Now I learned afterwards that this incident has had been used to slander me. Abdullah bin Ubayi was foremost among the slanderers and um, Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and her, she explains that um, when she was led back and she was left behind, Abdullah bin Ubayi, he had cried out and he had said, by God, she could not have remained chaste. Look, there comes the vice, wife of your prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, openly on the camel, led by the person, na'uzubillah summa na'uzubillah min zalik, led by the person with whom she has passed the night. Now, this is what hap was happening in the background. As Aisha explains that when I reached Medina, I fell ill and I stayed in bed for more than a month. Though I was quite unaware of the news of splendor, this was spreading like a, scan like a scandal in the city. And it had also reached Prophet Sallallahu And she explains that I noticed that he did not seem as concerned about my illness as he used to be. He used to come over to me, and but, but without basically directly addressing me directly, he would just inquire from others how I was, and then he would leave my house. So it troubled my mind and something, I felt that something was going wrong somewhere. 
So she explains that I took leave of him and I went to my mother's house so that I could be nursed better. And there, um, while she said that I was there, while I was there one night, I went out of the city to ease myself. And I was accompanied by one of my maternal aunts, the mother of Mr. Binosasa. And she was the first cousin of my father also. And she says that we were walking along when she stumbled over something and she cried out spontaneously. And she said, may Mr. perish or may there be the curse of Allah on Mr. And to this, I, I answered that what a good mother are you? That what a good mother are you that you are cursing your own son? The son who has taken part in the battle of Badr, you are cursing your own son? And she replied that my dear daughter, you're not aware of the scandal mongering. And then she told me everything about the campaign of the slander. And besides the hypocrites, how some true Muslims had also been involved in this campaign. And among them, she explained, that the leading part was of Mista and Hassan bin Sabit and um, Hazrat Hamna, the daughter of Jahash, who was the sister of Hazrat Zainab Razilahu ta'ala adha. So Hazrat Aisha says that um, hearing this horrible story, my blood, it curdled. And I immediately returned home and I passed the rest of the night crying over it. And uh, what was happening in Medina that uh, Hazrat Aisha explains that during my absence, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, um, he, he took counsel with Ali Razillahu Ta'ala Anhu and Hazrat Usama bin Zaid about this matter. And Hazrat Usama said what? He just had good words about me. And he said that, O Messenger of Allah, we have found nothing but good in your wife. All that is being spread about her is a lie. And uh, when Prophet Sallallahu he took counsel with Hazrat Ali. He said that, O oh, Messenger of Allah, there is no dearth of women. You may, if you like, marry another wife. If, however, you would like to investigate into the matter, you may send for her maidservant and inquire into it through her. So the maidservant was sent for and she was questioned. And what the reply of the maidservant was, she said that I... Declare, I declare on an oath by Allah who has sent you with the truth that I have never, ever, I have never seen any evil thing in her except that she just falls asleep when I tell her to look after the needed dough in my absence and the goat comes and eats it. So that was all what the, what the maidservant had to say for Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And then on the same day, Prophet also addressed the people and he said that, O Muslims, who from among you will defend my honor against the attacks of a person who has transgressed all bounds in doing harm to me by slandering my wife? By God, I have made a thorough inquiry and found nothing wrong with her, nor with the man whose name has been linked with her in the slander. <coughs> And then the rumors about the slander, as Aisha explained, they went on spreading in the city for about a full month. And this was a great source of great distress and anguish for Prophet Sallallahu also. And she said that I used to cry out of my helplessness and my parents, they were also sick. They were sick with mental agony. And at last, finally, one day, Prophet Sallallahu he visited us and he sat near me. And uh, he had not done this since the slander had started. And uh, feeling that something decisive was going to happen that day, Hazrat Abu Bakr and Hazrat Umar Roman, her, her, ma, her mother, they also sat near the both of them. And Hazrat Abu Bakr, uh, Prophet Sallallahu he started the conversation. And he said that, Aisha, I have heard this and this about you. I have heard this and this about you. And if you are innocent, I expect that Allah will declare your innocence. But if you have committed a sin, then you should offer repentance and ask Allah for forgiveness. Because when a servant of Allah confesses his guilt and repents, Allah forgives him. Now, as Aisha says that hearing all these words, tears dried up in my eyes. And I looked up to my father, expecting that he will reply to Prophet Sallallahu But he said, the daughter... I do not know what I, I should say. Then I turned to my mother, but she said that she also did not have anything to say. At last, Hazrat Aisha says that I said, 
that you have all heard something about me and you've believed it. Now, if I say that I am innocent and Allah is my witness that I am innocent, you will not believe me. And if I confess something which I never did and Allah knows that I never did it, you will believe me. So at that time, I tried to call by my memory the name of Hazrat Yaqub al-Islam, but I was so upset and tense that I could not even recall that. So I just said that I will say, I will just repeat the words what the father of Prophet Hazrat Yusuf al-Islam spoke, Faswabrun jamilun. that is that I will bear the whole of this false allegation with good grace and with patience. Now she says that saying all this, I laid down. And I turned to the other side and I was thinking that Allah was aware of my innocence and he would reveal the truth, which people uh, will reveal the truth. But she says that I could never imagine, I could never imagine that the divine revolution would come down in my defense. And then she said that I thought that most probably Prophet Salavarisim would see a dream in which Allah would indicate my innocence. But in the meantime, what happened was suddenly Prophet Sallallahu was in a state of revealing revolution and um, there were pearl-like drops of perspiration which used to appear on his face even in severe winters. And then we all held our breath and we all sat silent. As for me, I was fearless, but my parents seemed to be struck with fear and they, 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 they didn't know what was going to come up in the divine revolution. And when the revolution was over, Prophet Salavalism seemed to be very pleased and he was overjoyed. And um, he came over. The first words he spoke to Prophet, to Hazrat Aisha, and her were that he said, Congratulations, Aisha. Allah has sent down the proof of your innocence. And then he recited these verses from 11 to 21. And then my mother came over to me and she said to me, Get up and thank Prophet. Salavalism. And I said, I shall, I shall neither th thank him, I shall neither thank him, nor the two of you, but I will thank Allah. I will thank Allah who has sent down my absolution. But you did not even so much as contradict the charge against me. So this has been reported by the words of Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and her. And now going through the whole events, inshallah, if we read the verses, we will be able to understand. Verse number 11. Indeed, those who come with falsehood are a group among you. Do not think it is bad for you. So who the group was, they were Abdullah bin Ubay, Zaid bin Rafa'a, and uh, he was a Jew hypocrite. Then Mista bin Osasa, Hassan bin Sabit, and Hamna bin Tijahash. The first two were obvious hypocrites, and the last three, they were Muslims. And they had been involved in mischief because of some misunderstanding and because of a weakness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here has mentioned that he who has earned from the sin and he who took upon himself the greatest portion was whom? Was Abdullah bin Ubay. Moreover, in this verse, Allah also mentions that do not think it bad for you. Rather, it is good for you. So how was the whole incident of slander against Hazrat Aisha, anha, how was it good for the Muslims of Medina? Because obviously the hypocrites, they had, to, they had planned to inflict a defeat on the Muslims on a moral front. But Allah turned this mischief into a means of strength for the Muslims. Because you know that on this occasion, the conduct and the attitude adopted by Prophet Sallallahu Hazrat Abu Bakr and his family, and even the Muslims at large, it proved beyond any doubt that they were the purest people morally. How tolerant and how just they were and how noble and how forbearing their character was. <coughs> The whole event brought out their excellent moral conduct and their attitude. If Holy Prophet ﷺ had wished, he could have got all the people responsible for the attack on the honor of his beloved wife. He, had, he could have just ordered that they be beheaded immediately, but he bore everything with patience for a whole month. 
and he just he he enforced the punishment for kasaf only on those only on those three muslims who were who whose guilt was established and he even spared the hypocrites and similarly hazrat abu bakr and his family they also had been totally patient and they had demonstrated all forms of forbearance and forgiveness and pardoning also and above all hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha her own nobility of character can be judged by this that although hasan bin sabit he had played a prominent role in the campaign of slander against her she continued to treat him with due honor and esteem and when the people reminded her that he was the man who had slandered her she answered that no he was the one who used to rebut the anti islamic poets on behalf of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in islam so this was what it revealed her excellent con- conduct and her behavior of forbearance and patience and forgiveness similarly when uh, we learn that because of uh, the whole of this incident what was there was came from this that uh, cause of some very important additions to the social laws and injunctions of islam was what the law of kasaf the law of kasaf was announced after that the muslim society would can be kept clean and protected against the creation of propagation of moral evils and if at all they arise they can be corrected promptly so it was after this that the divine law of kasaf to save the muslim community from dishonoring the modest and from propagating the immorality in the islamic state this law was announced so this was what this came after the incident similarly uh, we can also learn that uh, prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh uh all the people clearly found out for themselves that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had no knowledge of the unseen the whole incident it clearly proved that he was like all other human beings he had no knowledge of unseen he knew only what allah taught him because like for full one month he remained in great anxiety he would sometimes make inquiries from the maid servants sometimes from other wives sometimes from hazrat ali and hazrat usama and at last he had spoken to hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha and he only what he had to speak was that if you have committed the sin you should offer repentance so he had possessed any knowledge of the unseen he would not have felt so upset nor would he have gone about making all these counselings or all these inquiries which he has been seen making in all these situations so it brought out the exact um, exact condition of a prophet itself also and helped uh, help all the people to develop the right type of faith and belief of prophet or the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam verse number 12 why why when you heard it did not the believing men and the believing women think of good of one another and say this is an obvious falsehood <coughs> and do, we do learn that companions did say that this was an obvious falsehood as did hazrat usama bin zaid or as did the the maid servant witness and also was to some extent the suggestion of hazrat ali also and then there is an incident which has been reported regarding hazrat uh, abu ayub ansari and his wife that when the wife of hazrat ayub ansari she heard about the whole event from the hypocrite women she mentioned before him the rumors of the slander and what did he have to say that the mother of ayub um ayub and saria if you had been there in place of hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha would you have done that she immediately replied that by god i would have never done that then hazrat ayub added he said that well aisha is much better a woman than you and as for myself if i had been in place of safan i could never have entertained such an evil thought and safan is a better muslim than i so they they were both husband and wife they finally also did negate against this rumor why did they who slandered not produce for it four witnesses and when they do not produce the witnesses then it is they in the sight of allah who are the liars and if it had not been for the favor of allah upon you and his mercy 
in this world and hereafter, you would have been touched for that lie in which you were involved by a great punishment. When you received it with your tongues and said with your mouths that of which you had no knowledge and thought it was an insignificant, it was insignificant while it was in the sight of Allah tremendous. And why, when you heard it, did you not say, it is not for us to speak of this? Exalted are you, O Allah, this is a great slander. And Allah warns you against returning to the likes of this conduct ever if you should be believers. And Allah makes clear to you the verses and Allah is knowing and wise. Indeed, those who like immorality should spread or publicized among those who have believed will have a painful punishment in this world and hereafter. And Allah knows and you do not know. If it had not been for the favor of Allah upon you and his mercy, and because Allah is kind and merciful, O oh, you who have believed, do not follow the footsteps of shaitan, and whoever follows the footsteps of shaitan, indeed, he enjoins immorality and wrongdoings. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, rabbi a'uzu bika min hamazat ash-shayateen, wa a'uzu bika rabbi in yahzaruni. Shaitan Indeed, he enjoins immorality and wrongdoing. And if not for the favor of Allah upon you and his mercy, not one of you would have been pure ever, but Allah purifies whom he wills and Allah is hearing and knowing. And let not those of virtue among you and wealth swear not to give aid to their relatives and needy and the emigrants of for the cause of Allah, and let them pardon and overlook. Would you not like that Allah should forgive you? And Allah is forgiving and merciful. This verse number 22 was revealed regarding uh, behavior which Hazrat Abu Bakr Sadiq radiallahu ta'ala and who he adopted following this slander. What happened was when Mr. Bin Osasa, he had played a, a very important role in the slander against Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and whose beloved daughter. Now what Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and who, he used to support the family of Mr. Bin Osasa after their immigration to Makkah from, his, from the money of his charity. Now, after he found out that Mr. Bin Osasa had been up to this, despite him doing, uh, despite all his good deeds and helping them up economically with his charity, Mr. Bin Osasa had come up with this and he had been so thankless to come up with this. He, after this, Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu ta'ala, and who he promised and he swore that they, he will not support them in future. Now, after this, this verse was revealed. And you know, the behavior and the manner of the companions was that when they, they went through the verses of Quran, they used to do what? As Allah says, Don't you think? Don't you ponder? Don't you think? Don't you concentrate on the messages of Quran that where do you stand? What do you, how do you behave in, in uh, regards this question and commandment of Quran? So when the companions, they used to go through or they used to recite or receive a verse from Prophet Wasallam, they used to do a self-analysis. So when he received this verse, he immediately analyzed what he was doing and he realized that what he had promised was not right. So he immediately, he immediately, he, he uh, had, he paid the atonement for breaking his promise and his pledge. And then he promised to keep on spending charity on Mr. and his family for the rest of his life. So this is the behavior of the companions as sami'na wa atwa'na and the behavior of the companions that when they realize that they have behaved in a manner which is contradictory to the commandments of Quran, they used to do what? They used to accept 
They used to confess. They used to regret, repent, seek forgiveness, and undo their behavior and reform themselves. Allahumma ja'alli min at-tawwabina wa ja'alli min al mutatwakhirin Indeed, those who falsely accuse chaste women are unaware, believing, unaware, and believing women are cursed in this world and hereafter, and they will, they will have a great punishment. We do know that any sin or any act or deed for which the words of Quran or Hadith mention a curse is what is a major sin. So falsely accusing, chaste, unaware, believing, believing women of fornication or adultery or immorality is what it is a major sin. Similarly, it has been reported in a tradition that Prophet ﷺ said, save yourselves from seven destructive sins. Mubikat. Mubikat are the seven sins. And out of this, <coughs> out of one of this is what is falsely accusing is falsely accusing chaste believing women for fornication or adultery. On a day when their tongues and their hands and their feet will bear witness against them, against who? Who were making false accusations of adultery and zina on, uh, on modest people. Bear witness against them as to why they used to do that. That day, Allah will pay them in full their deserved recompense, and they will know that it is Allah who is perfect in justice. Evil words are for evil men, and evil men are subjected to evil words, and good words are for good men, and good men are an object of good words. Those good people are declared innocent of what the slanderers say, for them is forgiveness and noble provision. O oh, you who have believed, do not enter houses other than your houses until you a certain welcome and greet the inhabitants that is best for you. Perhaps you will be reminded. Now in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching the believers a social ethic, the manner of entering houses other than their own houses. Because we know that the Arabs, they were, they were very crude. They were crude, uncouth, and uncivilized people. They used to enter each other's houses without taking any form of permission. And you know what? They used to go on entering even in the inner portions of the houses of others. So two manners have been taught here while entering somebody else's house. The first is do not enter anybody else's house. Hatta tasta nisu. Tasta nisu means what? That you a certain welcome means that you should not enter the house of anybody other than your own house until and unless you make sure you make sure that you are wanted. You are wanted and you are welcome that they do not dislike or they do not disapprove of your visit or your entry in their house. The second thing which has been instructed here is that when you enter anybody's house, you say what? You say salamun alaikum and you greet them. That is, in other words, it makes it uh, makes us all understand that you should make sure that your entry in the house is not disagreeable to the inmates and you are welcome in the house. And then when you enter, you need to say you need to say some greeting verses before you enter the house. So this is why to ensure the privacy and not merely uh, confined to the questioning of uh, entering into the house itself, it has been ensured by Hazrat Sorban radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Uh, Prophet sallallahu has explained the whole manner and the whole uh, mode in a much more detail. We have uh, learned this from multiple traditions, like Hazrat Sorban radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He explains that Prophet sallallahu said that when you have already cast a look into a house, what is then the sense of seeking permission for entry? And it has been reported in Abu Daud. So means what? That before seeking the permission, we need not peek and poke into the house so that we can find out what is going inside. 
So this is what? To ensure the privacy of the inhabitants of the house. Similarly, Hazrat Hosel Raziallahu ta'ala Anhu has also reported in Abu Dawood that uh, uh, there was a man who came to see Prophet Sallallahu and he sought the permission for entering while standing just in front of the door. And Prophet Sallallahu said to him, you stand aside. So this was why to prevent casting look inside the house. Similarly, there was a practice of Prophet Sallallahu that whenever he used to see somebody that he was standing aside to the right or to the left of the door and seeking permission as it was not the usual way, there were no curtains on the door, then this was the method which was taught by Prophet Sallallahu to the companions. And uh, similarly, Hazrat Anas Raziallahu ta'ala and who he reports that um, there, was, uh, there was a man he glanced into the one of the apartments or one of the rooms of Prophet Sallallahu from outside. That is, he peeped and he glanced from outside in the apartment of Prophet Sallallahu And Prophet Sallallahu at that time, he was holding an arrow in his hand. And he advanced towards the man as if, as if he would thrust the arrow in his belly. And it has been reported by Abu Dawud also. Similarly, it has been reported in Abu Dawood by Hazrat Abdullah bin Abbas Rasulullahu Taala Anhu that Prophet Sallallahu said that whoever glances, whoever glances through the letter of his brother without his permission, he glances into fire. So this is again ensuring the personal privacy of uh, of Muslims by other Muslims, like uh, listening to the telephonic conversation or listening to somebody's private conversation in a room, a mother or a sister standing outside when the husband and the wife, they are conversing inside their rooms, having a private conversation, or the son and the mother, they're having a private conversation and the, and the wife, uh, just hanging on around, trying to listen what they are, uh, they are indulging in what form of conversation. So this is all what, or reading anybody's email or reading anybody's message or whatever it is, this is what, interfering in privacy and this is like glancing into fire. Similarly, and this has been reported in Muslim Bukhari. Similarly, it has been reported in, uh, in another tradition that Prophet Allah said that if someone peeps into your house, if someone peeps into your house, it will be no sin if you injure his eyes with a piece of stone. And similarly, in another tradition, uh, it has been reported that Prophet said that the inmates of a house who injure the eye of a man peeping into their house are not liable to any punishment. And so to enter the house of another person is after seeking permission. And uh, it also implies to uh, enter the house of one's own mother or one's own sister also. Um, there was a person who asked Prophet Sallallahu that should I seek permission to enter my mother's house also? And Prophet Sallallahu told him that he should. And the man continued that my person, that my mother is sick and there's nobody other than me to look after her. Then even then do I need to get permission? Prophet Sallallahu said that yes, would you like that you should see your mother in a naked state? And uh, Hazrat Abdullah bin Masood, anhu, he says that one should seek permission even when going to see one's own mother or sister. Like even if he's not seeking permission, he should make a, a gesture like coughing extra, uh, like coughing or doing something like that to make them realize that he is approaching. And uh, the only exception of uh, seeking permission before going to somebody's house is like in a condition of emergency, like there is a calamity, like theft of, or, or, uh, or fire being set off, that in such a condition, the person can enter the house of the next person without asking for permission. And uh, when this order or this commandment and all these uh, words of Prophet Sallallahu came in those times the people they did not know the exact procedure to be followed that how they should go about by asking permission there was like <clears throat> an incident in the life of prophet Salavalism that there was a man who came to prophet Salavalism's house and shouted at the door should i be in should i be in and prophet Salavalism instructed the maid servant to go and to teach him the correct way and the correct way was Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. May I come in? And this has been reported by Ibn Jarir in Abu Dawud. 
Similarly, has a Jabir bin Abdullah. He explains an event in his life that he said that once he went to Prophet Sallallahu's house, and that was regarding <clears throat> he wanted to ask him something about the liabilities of his father, and he knocked at the door. And Prophet Sallallahu asked who it is. And he said that I replied, it is me. And then Prophet Sallallahu again repeated the question that who it is twice or thrice. And Hazrat Jabir bin Abdullah says that I kept on saying, it is me, it is me. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu added that that is how can one understand that who are you? So similarly, uh, we learned that there was a person who went to see Prophet Sallallahu and he got seated without saying assalamu alaikum and prophet sallallahu asked him to go out and come in again after calling assalamu alaikum so this was the correct method of seeking permission was number one to disclose one's identity first and then to seek permission and also to say assalamu alaikum so this was exactly the way hazrat umar and who used to behave when he used to go to see to uh, see Prophet Sallallahu He used to say, Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. I am Umar, may I enter? And this has been reported in Abu Dawud also. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu has enjoined that permission should be asked thrice at the most. And if there is no reply, even after the third call, then one should come back. This has been reported in Bukhari, Muslim and Abu Dawud. Similarly, it was Prophet Sallallahu own manner also. It's not just a, a instruction of the Hadith. It was Prophet Sallallahu own manner also. Uh, there's an incident which has been reported by Hazrat Saad bin Ubadah radiallahu ta'ala anhu that uh, Prophet Sallallahu he came over to their house one day and he sought permission twice after greeting and saying, Assalamu alaikum ya ahlul bayt. But there was no response. So after calling for the third time, when uh, Prophet Sallallahu he received no response, he turned back. But there, Hazrat Sahad radiallahu ta'ala, who came out running from the house and he said that, oh, messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I was hearing you all right, but I was desirous that you sent, you supplicate for mercy and peace for me and for my family members. So I was just... Um, I was just replying back to you in a low voice. So he came back and he called Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and he asked him to come to their house. So this was what? This was the manner of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he went to somebody else's house that he, uh, he uh, introduced himself and he asked for permission thrice and he said, Assalamu Alaikum. And when the permission was not granted to him, he went back. And that is exactly what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala orders in Quran also. That if you do not find anyone therein, do not enter them until permission has been given to you. And if it is said to you, go back, then go back. It is purer for you. And Allah is knowing of what you do. There is no blame upon you for entering houses not inhabited in which there is convenience for you. And Allah knows what you reveal and what you can see. Verse number 30. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders here and Allah says, Kulil mu'minina yaghuddu min abswarihim wa yahfazu faruchahum thalika azqalahum inna allaha khabirum bima yasna'oon Tell the believing men to do what? to reduce some of their visions and guard their private parts that is purer for them. Indeed, Allah is acquainted with what they do. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering the Muslim men to do what? Yaguddu min abswarihim. Ghain dwad dwad, ghadda. It means what? It means to reduce, to shorten, or to lower down something. And Allah is saying, Yahuddu min abuswarihim. Ghadde basar means what? It is generally translated as lowering of the gaze, to lower their gaze, to cut short their gaze, or to keep their gaze in a lowered condition. But what do we mean by Ghadde Basar? 
it does not imply in any form that the gaze by Muslim men has, they have to keep their gaze lowered all the time. It does not mean that, that one has to restrain one's gaze and avoid casting of looks freely everywhere and all the times, like to go about with a lowered gaze while you are walking on the roads, on the, on the, why with the pedestrians or crossing on a zebra crossing, banging into people or stumbling over the things. No, it does not mean that. What does it mean is that any gaze which is not desirable, which is not lawful, which is not permissible, has to be lowered. The gaze which lacks modesty, an immoral gaze which lacks modesty has to be lowered. And similarly, when the gaze of a person falls on the part of the body of a person, the satar, which is which is not lawful to be seen, or for any, the gaze falls or any scene or any picture which the person, any film, any image, any picture, any scene, which is not permissible for the Muslims to be seen, then they need to, they need to lure and they need to shift their gaze. Because what Allah is saying is, Yahudu, not all abswar, not all the gazes, min abswari him, min means what? From within a few. Min is for few, not all of their gazes, a few of their gazes. They need to lower the gazes which have, Im, which, have, which have an immoral intention, which have a vulgar intention, and which are, uh, which are indulging in any form other than modesty, then they need to be lowered down. It is not lawful for a man to cast a full gaze at the other woman except his own wife or the mehram woman of his family. Chance look is definitely pardonable, but not the second look, which one casts with a layer of the object. No, such gazing and glancing is wickedness of the eyes. This is definitely wickedness of the eyes. And um, Prophet Wasallam has been reported. He said that a man commits adultery a man commits adultery with all the sensory organs. The evil look at the other woman is the adultery of the eyes. The lustful talk is the adultery of the tongue. Relishing the other woman's voice is adultery of the ears and touching her body with the hand or walking for an unlawful purpose is adultery of the hands and the feet. And after these preliminaries, the sexual organs either bring the act of adultery to completion or leave it incomplete. This has been reported in Bukhari, Muslim, and Abu Dawud. So this is it. That is why lowering down of the gaze has been promised, has been ordered by Quran and the words of Hadith. Hazrat Barda radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Tirmizi, Mustafa Ahmad, and Abu Dawud, the Prophet sallallahu instructed Hazrat Ali and said, Ali, laqal'u, to Ali, do not cause a second gaze after the first look. Ali, for you, is permissible the first gaze, but not the second gaze. And remember, the first gaze also, the moment the person realizes that the first gaze which has been put is not on something permissible and lawful for the person to, say, uh, to see, should be lowered immediately. We should not just carry on with the first gaze without blinking that we had just, we've just been allowed with one gaze and we might just like carry on with the first gaze. No. So, Ali laqal ula wa laysa laqal ukhra. Similarly, Hazrat Jarir bin Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Mustad Ahmad and Tirimzi Abu Dawud and Nisai that Prophet sallallahu was asked that what should I do if I happen to cast a chance look? Prophet sallallahu said, turn your eyes away or lower your gaze. Hazrat Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala and who quotes the Prophet sallallahu said, Allah says that gaze is one of the poisonous arrows of shaitan. And we have, we have weak traditions. It has been reported as a weak tradition, but no doubt it is right. It is for sure that gaze is one of the poisonous arrows of shaitan. Because, you know, as is sent in a, in a famous proverb that what the eye admires, the heart desires. So the eye, the look, the gaze itself is the triggering factor. 
So trying to, telling us to lower the gaze is like what? It is like nipping the evil in the bud. Before the eye admires something, it likes something, and then the heart starts admiring. The person, the Muslim believers, they've been ordered to lower their gaze to prevent from the malice and corruption of the heart itself. Similarly, it has been reported, it has been reported in another tradition that Prophet Sallallahu said, it has been reported by Abu Umama that Prophet Sallallahu said that if a Muslim, if a Muslim happens to glance at the charm of a woman and then turns his eyes away, Allah will bless his worship and devotion. Allah will bless his worship and devotion and will make it all more sweet. It has been reported in most of Ahmad. And similarly, in another tradition reported by Abdullah Ansari, that Prophet said that the person will relish that uh, whoever forsakes his gaze out of the fear of Allah, he will be rewarded with faith whose sweetness he will relish in his own heart. So this is the reward in this worldly life for what? For controlling, for controlling, for restraining and for lowering one's gaze. And it has been reported by Imam Bukhari that uh, uh, he who quoted what Hazrat Jabir bin Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala and who and Hazrat Ibn Abbas that on the occasion of the farewell pilgrimage, Hazrat Fazl bin Abbas, he was the maternal cousin of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was um, riding with Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the camel back during the return journey from uh, Mashar al-Haram. And when uh, the, uh, there was a woman who came, who passed by, and she stopped by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she was wanting to ask something. And Hazrat Fazl radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was staring at the woman. And when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he realized what Hazrat Fazl was doing, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put his hand on his face and he turned it on the other side. And it has been reported in Abu Dal. And similarly, on another occasion, in the same pilgrimage, a woman of the clan, she came and she stopped by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she sought a clarification about a certain matter pertaining to Hajj. And Fazl bin Abbas, he fixed his gaze at her face. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he realized this, he turned his face to the other side. And this has been reported in Bukhari, Abu Dawud, and Tarimzi. So this is regarding the order of Yaquddu min Absuarihim. And um, gaze was enjoined because we cannot, we cannot attribute to this. People just misunderstand this verse also. And uh, so nobody should have the misunderstanding that the command for the Muslim men to restrain their gaze would mean that the women were allowed to move about freely with open faces. Because they say that if wailing of the face of Muslim women had already been enjoined, the question of restraining or not restraining the gaze would not have arisen. This argument is totally incorrect. And it is rationally as well, it is not right. Because you know that even if wailing of the face is a usual custom, Occasions, they can arise when, when a man and a woman, they can come face to face under certain situations. So for them, this order does exist. And there will be, moreover, there will be in a Muslim state, in a Muslim society also, there will be non-Muslim women who continue to move about without wailing their faces. So the commandment to lower the gaze or to restrain their gaze does not by any mean mean that the women folk of a Muslim society, they are allowed or permitted to go about without veils of their faces. And um, Abu Dawood contains an incident of a woman, of a companion, Hazrat Umm Khalad, anhu, regarding whom we found that uh, in a battle, one of her sons and one of her brothers, they were killed in a battle. And she came to Prophet ﷺ to inquire about their condition. And she was wearing a veil as usual. And obviously in such a sad occasion, uh, one might be liable to lose one's balance and ignore the restrictions of uh, uh, the, the commandments of Allah. But when she came, even in this condition of grief, she was observing her wail and her parda. The companions, they were awestruck. 
And she answered, she said that I have certainly lost my son and my brother, but I have not lost my modesty. So there it was, the women, despite this order of Ghadde Bathar for the Muslim men, they were going about with their faces veiled. Similarly, Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she has stated that during the farewell pilgrim, when they were moving towards Makkah in state of Ihram, the women, they used to lower down their head sheets over their faces. Obviously not the cloth touching their faces, but they used to lower down their head sheets over their faces whenever the travelers passed by them. And they would uncover their faces when the travelers passed away. So then we also need to learn about other exceptions to the command of lowering the gaze or restraining the look is, uh, when it becomes a reality, when it becomes a real necessity for a man to look at a woman. And this is generally when the man intends to marry the woman. As has been reported by Hazrat Mughaira bin Shoba, anhu, that there was a companion who came to Prophet وسلم, and he informed that he wanted to marry in a certain family. And Prophet وسلم, asked the person that uh, whether he had seen the girl or not, and he replied in negative. Then Prophet Sallallahu advised that have a look at her. This will, this will enhance harmony in the relationship between the two of you. And it has been reported in Muslim Ahmad and Tarimzi, Nisai Ibn Majab. Similarly, in, according to another tradition by Hazrat Abu Huraira, anhu, there was a man and he wanted to marry in a family of Ansar. And uh, he came to Prophet Sallallahu and he mentioned that he wanted to marry an Ansari woman. And Prophet Sallallahu asked him to have a look at that girl for the Ansar usually had a defect in their eyes. And this has been reported in Muslim Nasai and Muslim Ahmad. Similarly, according to Hazrat Jabir bin Abdullah, Prophet Sallallahu said that when a person from among you wants to marry a woman, he should have a look at her to satisfy himself that there is some quality in that woman which induces him to marry her. And this has been reported in Muslim Ahmad and Abu Daud. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu also permitted the Muslim men to see the Muslim girl if he wants to marry her, despite the fact that she is not aware of it. So, um, and regarding this command of restraining the gaze, this also implies that no man or no woman should look at the private parts of other man or woman also. As has been reported in a tradition that Prophet Sallallahu said, that no man should look at the satr of another man and nor a woman should look at the satr of another woman. This has been reported in uh, Muslim, Mustad Ahmad and Abu Dawood. Similarly, Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu has quoted that Prophet sallallahu said, do not look at the thigh of another person living or dead. This is reported in Abu Dawood and Ibn Majah. So this is exactly what the order to lower down the gaze means. And then Allah says, guard the private paths. That they should guard their private paths. This is an order which has been given to all the Muslim men that they need to abstain or to refrain from illicit sexual gratification. And then... <coughs> And not only illicit sexual gratification, also from exposing their satr before others. Because for males, we know that the satr is a part of the body from the navel to the knee. And it is not permissible for the Muslim men to expose this part of the body intentionally before anybody, before anybody except one's wife. And uh, has that the... Uh, uh, Prophet Sallallahu has been reported, it has been reported that there was a companion who was sitting in the company of Prophet Sallallahu and was exposing his thigh. And Prophet Sallallahu said, do you not know the thigh has to be kept concealed? That the thigh has to be kept concealed. So this also very clearly explains the dress code for the Muslim men also. And this has been reported in Tirimdi and Abu Daud. Hazrat Ali Rosiallahu Ta'ala and who reports that Prophet said, Do not expose your thigh. This has been reported in Abu Daud and Ibn Majah. And not only uh, is the satr to be concealed before others, but even when the person is alone, Prophet informed, he said, 
that be aware, never remain naked for you, for we, for with you are those, that is the angels of goodness and mercy who never leave you alone except when you ease yourself or except when you go to your wives. So feel shy of them. So feel shy of them and give them their due respect. Similarly, according to another tradition, Prophet ﷺ has said that guard your satar from everyone except your wife and your slave girls. And the questioner asked that even when we were alone, and Prophet ﷺ said, yes, even if you were alone, for Allah has a greater right that you should feel shy of him. This has been reported by Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, and Ibn Majah. Rabbana la tuzir qulubana ba'da is khadaytana wa hab lana min ladunka rahma innaka antal wahhab subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk subhana rabbika rabbil izati amma yasifun wa salamun alal mursalin walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin amin summa amin